Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. And hey, thanks for joining me for a chuckle here in my two-car garage. That's right, Kanucky Stand, the people's empire of dirt. You may ask yourself, self, what in the Jesus four would anyone ever spend 500 Canadian pesos on yonder cap lamp? Well, I'll tell you who would. A mine. Reason one, la première étoile, you need to make this robust enough so that it lasts underground, a mile underground, because the poor bastard miner, if he loses his light, he, it is no fun. Your eyes start to see things, little sparkles and pixies and whatnot, and you start to hear things and freak right the fuck out. The main, the main money shot, why this is 500 bucks, I'm going to show you here. Made in Canaderp. Serialized, class one, div one, explosion proof, and MSHAW approved. MSHAW being the Mine Health Association something something of America. You know, you, you slap a marine grade sticker on something, price goes up by 200%. Well, if you get underground service, mine duty, you slap a sticker like that on some son of a diddly price goes up probably a thousand percent and this is the case yeah now i'll forgive you if you think that cave-in is the most dangerous part of working in a mine it's not even close a little chunk of rock about this big falling from the back 12 feet up that'll take you out way quicker than <laughs> yeah there's... what you're really worried about is runaway equipment loose and fire so we have to make sure that the gear that we bring into the mine is approved for not catching on fire. And it's not so much the fire, it's that there's forced air ventilation everywhere and if something catches fire, it kills everybody on account of the carbon monoxide, pison. That's the long, short and hairy of it, why it's 500 Kanaki Stan Copex on account of the liability and all the testing that goes into these. Funny story though, or not so funny, these, get used in the mine every day 24 7 nobody even bats an eye so we're just waiting for uh, blood to spill and then they'll figure out that maybe these aren't the best things to have uh, thrown around by <laughs> people who break things for a living I'm talking about miners that's right breaking rock for a living Here we got a nice little stainless steel bracket for changing the angle We'll see what kind of uh, a slightly magnetic. I'd say that's a, so it's not a 300 series. Could be a 400 series, uh, Austinetic, but th those are expensive. So more than likely this is a ferritic stainless steel. And I've never seen one of these break, so they're fairly skookum. The fastener comes out quite often, as you, well, as you can see doubled up on the fastener here we're missing one and this would be polycarbonate high impact resistant plastic and you can see it's got some molded in in the mold it's got brass threaded inserts molded in and a Buna N gasket to seal out all the schmoo and these get just completely trashed from the silica in the air <laughs> yeah there's no silica in mines anymore yeah yeah and uh, also just the dirt and the muck that gets spattered on here. And guys just take their finger and clean that up. Now being polycarbonate to clean this, if you have the wrong, if, if you use brake clean and it's the wrong kind of brake clean, it's fluorinated, it will crack this right half in two right now. And if I can find the right solvent, uh, I might just sacrifice this one to the YouTube gods. Here's the weird word surmounting. Interestingly, no casting marks on it. A Buna N a little well, condom, for lack of a better word, and it's just glued in. It's not uh, so it's not over molded. Glued right in there, and this has got to be nylon, glass fiber reinforced. It sounds like it when you cut it, and then the battery just put in place with double-sided foam tape. These are the charging port tabs, and uh, the tabs we see here are actually just fasteners there we go fasteners two little dots in there what for getting the tool in to tighten it up and then we have either copper or some sort of chrome or nickel plated and then silicone in place just to prevent that from backing off on you 
You can see here it's got brass inserts for the fasteners. Overall, nothing really too special. Pretty thick though, beefy. There's no moving that at all, so nice and thick. No material spared, but other than that, nothing really all that special. There's a nice warm human touch. Always nice to see a, a clammy mitt <laughs> has been over this. You can see on the ejector pin here, they must have had some schmoo. And you can see actually there's three cut marks. Start over here and cut whatever that schmoo is. Right orf. Humans, I salute you. Oh, here's the battery made in JA Pan, Pan of Suck it. Nice quality battery. As to the size, I do not know. I'm not sure of the nomenclature of these. Now these must come untabbed and they tab weld them and put the cap on a polyamid tape on there. A high temperature tape. It won't melt. It'll burn, but it won't melt. You can see we got the quality stamp on there. Now, this is just a little protection circuit, probably over temp. I bet you there is a like a fuse or a, a, well, probably a thermostatic fuse. So if it gets over temp, it opens and never works again. So if your $500 cap lamp ain't working and you got to fix it, it's more than likely this. Okay, some interesting features on the board. Some pogo pins here. These are spring loaded. What for indexing on the charging ports. We got a little mic, uh, microchip pick controller. That's the brains of the operation. A whole bunch of surface mount stuff here. Little, like, just passive elements, uh, resistors and capacitors and stuff. There's a bigger surface mount capacitor and an inductor as well. So I think there must be a switch mode power supply on here. And interestingly, it says 12 volts DC as well as 12 volts AC this will input. Now this is only a 4 volt battery, so we must have some rectification, which is odd. Yeah, there we go. There's a diode bridge, so there's your rectifier. And then that's, that means that this capacitor has got to be part of the filtering. But it's way the hell up there. Let's see here. Via. Oh yeah, it goes all the way around the periphery over to the capacitor. A big MOSFET here. Must be for switching on the main LED. And look at the size of the tactile switch. So this is very telling. They're taking care of where the mother rum where the mother reads the road. That is uh <laughs> where the oh it's working. Hey <laughs> it works I fixed it. There you can see here there's the bright one that's four thousand lux and there's the less bright one. Well, also you can put her in party mode as well by depressing. There we go. I don't see a designated boost converter chip on here. So they must be using the microcontroller and this inductor would be part of the boost or the buck converter just to charge the battery. So the PIC is doing everything. It's doing uh, the monitoring of the switch. It's doing the monitoring of the voltage. It's also doing the conversion of 12 volts into... That's funny that they wouldn't just have just a voltage regulator on there. I guess then they can't control the charging as well. Yeah, so that's all there is to it. Now you look at the components on there, you know, you probably spin up 5,000 of those boards for 10 bucks a piece. Your battery, figure 10 bucks. Your assembly, 10 bucks, 30 bucks. Uh, 200, yeah, they're, they're making a fair profit on that. Still though, there's a lot of liability. Now, I don't begrudge anybody making a fair profit, especially considering they're putting out a quality product. You look at where this serves its duty. I mean, the favorite tool of miners everywhere, a thumb detecting nut fucker. It comes with a widelerizer installed. Uh, this is the type of guy that you're providing <laughs> a service to, a product to, so it has to be fairly skookum. And in order to be skookum, they got to charge the box. That's just the way it is.
I mean, my favorite libation for sure. I'm so excited I can't even fucking talk. But chlorinated brake clean kills plastics, especially of the polycarbonate type. Whilst it didn't crack her right half in two, it did fuck her good and proper. You see that schmoo on there? And the surface finish is totally destroyed. What I was hoping would happen was this would act like uh, boros not borosilica glass, but tempered glass. If you have a gander through my back catalog there, not that way, my old Vijay hose, you'll see I once tried to cut what I thought was borosilica glass, but ended up just being tempered crappy soda glass. And what that is, is when it's tempered now, there's internal stressors and strainers in there. And the thing is just barely holding together. So it seems like it's really strong, but what's really happening is it's pre-stressed and it's just waiting to explode on you. So when I went ahead and, and bored the hole, all those stressors and strainers, and if you, uh, you can actually see them, if you look through a polarizing lens, you can see these different diffraction gratings, uh, these different diffraction, you'll see different colors anyway, and you can see where the strain is in the glass. Okay, so I have this layered stuff that's all just ready to explode and I try and cut a hole in it. Well, guess what? Explodes every time. Can't cut tempered glass. Sorry to tell you, I had to learn that the hard way. Can't cut tempered glass. Now, this stuff doesn't look like it'd be like that because it's plastic, it's completely uniform, right? Wrong, wrong. Anything you think is uniform is not really uniform. On the surface, there are little imperfections, divots, cracks, this, that, and there's different strains in here because this cools differentially after it gets molded, right? So there is going to be intrinsic stress in here. And when you put a solvent on it, it different well it's going to dissolve some of that surface now if the stressors and strainers in the material stay in balance it won't crack half in two so i was hoping that i could get it out of balance enough with the solvent that it would crack half in two didn't do that but as you can see still decorative right proper i just got one of these factory direct mouse specials right uh, right from the dollarama overstock it's got the Jewelers Rouge on there. You could use toothpaste as well. I'm going to try and polish that up. Two strikes. I ain't out yet. We're going to try it. I mean, the polishing, yeah. Meh, didn't work that good. We're going to give ourselves a little helping hand. Now, that is soft. Now, we're going to retry this with my favorite libation, of course, but just a different flavor. I thought I'd be able to break her right half in two just uh, chemically, but no, just made her milky. However, mechanically, you can repolish it. Just got to get rid of that milky stuff, uh, break through the milky layer. Thanks for watching. Keep your dick in a vice. While we're on the subject of mining, I figured I'd get a hold of somebody that actually put up some footage on YouTube of mining. This is Jory Dion's channel. He puts up uh, videos just like this. A proper miner, hard rock miner. And you can see he's got his cap lamp on there. He's just got, he's setting up uh, with a jack leg, which is an air drill. He's bolting up some resin rebar bolts into a refuge station. This is essentially a fresh air base in case there's a fire or something in the mine. And you can see he's actually properly uh, screening as well. What that does is, well, there's resin rebar. You drill a hole and you put a piece of rebar in there and it's uh, epoxied in. That'll hold, that'll pull out at about 40 ton or so, so occasionally you'll see a big fucking nugget hanging by one of these things. But uh, the screen is actually for the stuff that'll really hurt you, which is the fist size stuff that falls off the back. The back, of course, being a, being the, the ceiling, because you're in the belly of the beast, right? So it's the back and the rib and the, and the sill. Um, here, he's got a jack leg. You can see this is a highly physically intense job and he's he's got two steels going uh, different lengths 
because the jack leg jack that that big long piston there that ram that's only so long so what he does is yeah, look at this consummate professional here it's a dance look at the guy go yeah he, uh, he knows what he's doing clearly and then he's going to fill that in a shorter hole that's a nice long looks like a eight or ten foot steel and he's going to pack that and get ready once the jack leg you know, he's he's repositioning the jack leg a little bit uh, a lot of times they'll do that on a ladder that'll go up against the ladder that's bolted to the rib but uh, he's just doing it on a muck pile you see he's got a partner or a, a nipper back there helping him out and he keeps looking back there maybe the shifter his boss is coming by to see how he's doing you see this is air driven and there's also water coming in that smaller hose that's just to keep the dust down as you can see uh, it is not for the faint of heart